I would like to say how happy I am to be standing here like this right now, but perhaps I'll feel better in 45 minutes' time. Um, my connection with the society goes back into the 1960s when, as an impoverished student, looking for resources to pay my typist for my PhD thesis, I put in an essay for the, um, the then university's essay prize. And it is particularly delightful to see sitting there, Dr. Peter Karash, because although we were the only two candidates for the year, I was writing on early Indian nationalism and he was writing on a serious subject. And so, of course, we both of us lost out because the prize was divided equally between us. So instead of getting 50 quid, we only got 25 pounds. <laughs> And my election as a fellow came about because I was ganged up on by uh, Francis Robinson and Richard Gombrich, who are again represent two sort of quite different aspects of Asian studies. And I was told it was my duty to subscribe. I didn't have to come to anything. I didn't, I just had to pay my due. So, I did that for a good many years, and then absolutely out of the blue, when I retired as the editor of Modern Asian Studies, uh, we had a party in Cambridge to which Professor Stockwell came. And uh, in the party, he moseyed up to me and he said, um, you will of course know because this was when I was about to give up proper paid employment, you will, of course, now take a role in the Royal Asiatic Society, won't you? And I had no idea what he was talking about. But I'm grateful to all these people, because actually, um, since, uh, since 2009, 2010, um, I have found enormous pleasure in being involved with the society in lots of different ways and in uh, helping it. Um, no, that's, I'm just observing how tremendously successful uh, it has become and how it has grown so much from strength to strength um, in that period from the 60s to uh, to the present day. So that's really saying uh, everything is gunko, um, and uh, we had the most stirring uh, account of the last year's proceedings from the president, uh, which you know I cannot possibly uh, sort of top. But I can perhaps uh, give a, a little sort of wry context to, uh, to all of them. A very dear and close friend in Cambridge on uh, being congratulated on his 90th birthday said, there's no virtue in just getting old, he said. The years just slip by and you can do nothing about it. But institutions are, of course, a bit different because an institution won't survive if it does not continue to have a serious purpose. And it won't survive either if it is, does not have the capacity to change how it fulfills its objective. And so to get to 200 actually means that the society fulfills a really serious purpose. And also over the years, it has changed how that purpose 
has been fulfilled. The best account is just right there on, on, on the screen. A place for those who are interested in the history, languages, cultures, and religions of Asia. And you have to remember that this society came out of that amazing 18th century Enlightenment period, when serious people thought that if one acquired knowledge, if one did serious research, if one found out about things, then there was a possibility of reforming the horrid, unequal, decadent societies in which we all lived. And, of course, there was the chase of, as it were, just out of curiosity. How can we find out more about ourselves and how can we use that knowledge, really, to lead to some sort of improvement? So there are two levels here. There's the natural innate curiosity in people who get excited about the most peculiar things, about discovering the most amazing uh, things. Let me give you an example of that, because I don't want to lose sight of, of that point that knowledge is a value, a good in itself, and it's really exciting if you are curious about something and you find something uh, out that's particularly uh, that's particularly good. Now, one of the great figures in the society in the early 20th century or in the 20th century was Sir Richard Winstead, who was a colonial officer and uh, served in Malaysia. He served in Malaysia from 1902, and he was the very involved with educational policy uh, in, in Malaysia, and he promoted education, particularly um, at, the, uh, at, the, um, at, the, at the university uh, level. And he, he recalls that when he was in a deep fever uh, and weighing only 80 pounds, he had this sudden realization that everything that was contained in the Greek middle was contained in the Malaysian, in the Malay reflexive verb. Now, I'm not going to explain to you the technicality behind that point, but Derek Davis, who's sitting in the back, will be happy to tell you <laughs> about it. Uh, late, late, later on. And Winstead also recalled, this is in 1946, I think, that he was, no, it's in 1963, I'm sorry. He, he also recalled that when he had been serving in Iraq, the Sultan had a most beautiful bowl with a design that looked like grapes and foxes uh, on it. And he, he read in a Stockholm journal of Oriental Studies a piece of research that suggested that this design from the Sultan's uh, late medieval bow may have had its origin in Tang, China, and that it had got to Tang, China in the Manichaean uh, period. And he was fascinated by the fact that that showed how there was some sort of underlying sort of unity in humanity, that we experienced things that were common to us all, whatever our race, religion, creed, etc. And that, of course, was true of William Jones who, the, as, he, as he rounded uh, uh, into the, sailed into the Bay of Bengal 
and he was just in awe of everything that lay in front of him and the prospect that he would be able to find things of interest about humanity everywhere and in every subject. So it's very generous, this interested in history, languages, cultures, and the religions of Asia. And the founders of the society were also very generous in their definition of Asia. Because of course, besides Asia, and what is Asia, right? We have the Persian Gulf, we have the Middle East, we have bits of Africa, gosh, we can extend it to Spain. You know. So it's important, I think, to see that the driving force behind establishing the Asiatic Society in London was a keenness by uh, people to tell people in Britain, who of course didn't know anything about anything, not even in the next village in London, uh, tell them about Asia and about the wonderful uh, languages, history and culture uh, there was there. And in that first 50 years, the society uh, built up through donations mainly, most amazing collections of books, manuscripts, copies of manuscripts, of artifacts, of paintings, uh, personal records, research notes by people uh, working in, uh, in Asia. Uh, they built it up and, it, and it, it's here and it's in, in this room. And a great strength of, of the society, a great strength of that, is to understand that these collections are not static and stable things because you can keep on going back to them. You can keep on looking at them. You can keep on answering new questions from the material that is in them. Therefore, it is of critical importance that the society has active research going on, managed in the society by people who are familiar with the collections, who can themselves contribute to defining fields of knowledge and lines of inquiry, and who can connect scholars from different parts of the country, from different parts of the world, just over a cup of tea saying, oh, do you know so-and-so was in here the other week? And they were looking at this and they found this interesting. So the collections are an important core of the society's activity. And they are not possessions to be held hugger-mugger. They are possessions held in trust for the world of learning and they have to be made known, and they have to be used, and they have to be appreciated. And that is why at 200, it's so thrilling, actually, that the technology that some of us can't handle, and most of us of our sort of age don't like, that that technology is permitting that to happen on an unprecedented scale. And it is really opening up uh, in ways that are not possible when you just have a reading room and when you just have stacks and when you just have someone who comes in occasionally to dust the books. It doesn't happen then, but it does if you have a dynamic librarian, an archivist, and if you have this network uh, virtual community. And so on that note, the future of the society is terrific because of course, you know, we've only done the digitization on three backs of envelopes compared to what's there uh, downstairs 
in the basement. And so to push forward with that and to do it in a way that feeds into current scholarship uh, and, and, and continuing scholarship is a very impressive and important thing uh, to be doing. Now, the society, to begin with, was so generous that it didn't have anywhere really to put anything. It decided very early on, or some members of the society decided very early on, that although uh, they were an expensive club, you did have to pay three guineas a year to subscribe. And that, if you, for what it's worth, if you look at the Bank of England inflation calculator, is over £300 a year fee in those early days. And as a footnote, um, the, uh, the new TARD is actually cheaper than the original TARD because at £800 a throw, it's an absolute snip compared to the nine guineas that it was in the 1830s. I got diverted. <laughs> so, so they had nowhere to put it. What they wanted uh, primarily because they were high-minded uh, and they were intellectual, they wanted a place to meet, a place to read papers, a place to put their stuff. They'd already decided by 1824 that they were not going to be a club because, of course, quite a lot of the people who had served in the East were not high-minded and they didn't just want a place to come and read a book every now and then. So in 1824, some of the fellows of the society decided they'd better have a proper club and so they formed the Oriental uh, Club. The Oriental Club was a very elite club because it didn't want tradesmen or funny people like that in it. It only wanted very serious uh, public service people from who had served in the East where they could meet and enjoy themselves and have bed and breakfast and food and so on. But they did, as a concession, admit that criterion for joining, for applying to join the Oriental Club would be be a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society. So that was all. The society hired on leasehold a number of places from 1824 to put their stuff and to hold their meeting. Now, the interesting thing about all these places is that they were all in Mayfair. Why, one might ask? Well, as Peter Collin, in his wonderful tracepography of the members of the society of the first 10 years of its existence, has shown quite conclusively, most of the early fellows of the society had residences in Mayfair. And of course, besides the Johnny Come Lately Oriental Club, that's where all the club activity was. So there is this great overlay of elite, metropolitan, social uh, classes and high-minded scholarly interests. The society began in, Craft in Grafton Street, it went to New Burlington Street, went to Albemarle Street, it went to Grosvenor Street, it went to Queen Anne Street, it went to Queen's Gardens. And in the 1930s, when it became a little clearer that the, the scholarly side of the society, as it were, might possibly benefit from being nearer museum, British Museum, uh, SOAS, University College, that sort of shady bit, Bloomsbury, it's Rovia. 
where the uh, you know the the odd sort of academic types hung out who wouldn't necessarily be wearing the right shoes to go into the club. They thought in the in the 1930s, perhaps we should move, perhaps we should move to Bloomsbury, particularly when SOAS moved from Finsbury, where Finsbury Circus to uh, to Bloomsbury. But after a short discussion, it was determined that it was not in the interest of the society to move east of Bond Street. <laughs> It wasn't really until the move into um, into Queen Anne Street was looking uh, tricky, or getting out of Queen Anne Street was looking tricky, that uh, a search was made for somewhere really more suitable for what had then become the main um, supporters of the society, and. It wasn't until uh, the 1990s when it was desperate to move out of Queen's Gardens that uh, the, the nose was held or the dive into the icy water was undertaken. And here we are in railway offices uh, behind Euston. But we are very, very near all these other wonderful cultural institutions. It's very easy to get to us. I don't know about Peter, but I had no idea how I was going to find my way from Trinity, Cambridge uh, to, um, uh, to Queen Anne Street uh, to, to pick up my miserable 25 pound check. So ease of communication located with other interesting scholarly, cultural uh, associations uh, was key. And actually, these railway offices are wonderful for the purpose that we need. What all these other buildings have, all these grand places in Mayfair, is they were a disaster in maintenance terms. Dry rot, wet rot, fan lights falling in, nowhere to store the books, no problem, you just pile them up on the staircases. Nowhere to exhibit any of the uh, of the artwork. No, well, we'll just we'll just put it into storage and get it. And of course. They were increasingly hammered by rising costs, by maintenance costs, by rates, and so on. So the move here was a stroke of gene. And like most of the story that I'm now going to tell, it is really associated with the presidency's of Francis Robinson and Tony Stockwell and the close colleagues who worked with them. Because make no mistake about it, the late 20th century was cruel beyond belief for the society. First of all, of course, it lost the patricians. They were important because Although they didn't put much money in, and although they may have been quite patronizing to ordinary uh, scholars, apart from the handful of them who were true geniuses, uh, they actually knew where you could lay hands on money when you needed it. And so there is no need for the society to have a lot of money. There is no call for it to have a lot of members. There is always you could just sort of scrape by because one connection or another would allow you uh, to pull in resource in a collaborative way uh, to do what was necessary to produce uh, the scholarship that was uh, that was produced. 
So they disappeared. And with them disappeared some of the subventions. We always say, you know, never any public money in the RAS, no government support. But actually, you know, the government of India, the government of the Federated Malay States, the government of Hong Kong, the British Academy, all pumped money on a regular basis into the society. And that too began to disappear. But fortunately, and those of you who studied bureaucracies will appreciate this, some of it took a very long time to disappear. But of course, nobody thought that you should increase the subvention. So it was still in the 1990s, a fiver from the Malay states, or £10 from the government of India, or £10 from the government of Pakistan, when they remembered. Of course, they didn't always remember. And of course, when those tariffs had started, they were substantial uh, figures and means of support. So the, the real crisis in the society's affair, affairs really comes in that mid 20th century period, because that's the point at which the underpinnings of the society, which had been the scholarly Mandarin, the public servant who kept a scholarly string to his bow, working in the East primarily, uh, these were the people who maintained and and supported the society and made everything possible. They were all going to be dying out. And the colonial service was also dying out. And so something that had been, as it were, or that had become an adjunct to uh, the interaction between Britain and Asia, Britain and the Middle East, Britain and the Far East, uh, something that had been uh, almost the scholarly hobby wing of, of, of colonialism, uh, that too was coming under question. So the question was, who is then going to support it? Well, here the problem became interesting because you look in the 19th century, the Asiatic society has a unique role in that it didn't have competitors. They weren't interested in Oxford and Cambridge and London universities in the sort of studies that were promoted so vigorously uh, in, by the, the Asiatic society. And similarly, the Asiatic Society had established a position of prestige in a group, a cluster of subjects that it's easy just to um, stereotype as being philology, a little bit of certain sort of archaeology, uh, epigraphy, an, an undoing, a, a trying to unravel script. And this, of course, had been at the heart of much continental scholarship, European continental scholarship, uh, particularly uh, in the Germanic uh, traditions. And uh, of course, it had had, they just weren't interested in, in, in Britain on that. So the society had a unique role. And gradually, the unique role of being interested in the history, languages, cultures, and religions of Asia began to leak away from the society as it became trapped, really, with a view that this was a place that was only interested in philology and epigraphy and a certain source. Now, it still wasn't. That was an unfair characterization, but it was a characterization that stuck. And of course, it seeped away because, first of all, 
um, SOAS was founded, a serious university institution, although it was a miracle in itself that it ever was founded or that it has ever survived, but it has, and it's brilliant, and we would be at loss without it. And the other universities began to take an interest so that as the century progressed, we found Asian studies in this very generous sense being taken up in lots of other places. And the society didn't seem to be terribly interested in that. That's not quite fair because at the end of the Second World War, there was a great boost that the society, which had earlier and rightly claimed to be one of the forefathers of SOAS, the society also backed the report by its president, Lord Scarborough, that said, you know, the government must put a lot of money into Asian studies, uh, into British universities. And the government did. But it only did it for about five or six years, and the thing came to a stop. And of course, the, the point of the Scarborough report, which was a, is a very high-minded um, document, is that we do really need to, particularly in the post-colonial period and in the post-war period, we really do need to uh, understand the rest of the world so that we can find out how Britain fits in it and how Britain can continue to understand and work in it. But it was the beginning of a really serious, vicious and unsatisfactory division in academia between, on the one hand, those who said we can do no studies without language, without philology, without dictionaries, without having uh, courses that uh, are the basis of all these flippity subjects like geography, history, economics, sociology, and so on. And of course, what the Philistines would say on the other side was that you know, the trouble is anybody who really knows anything about Asia knows nothing about the modern societies of Asia. They can read the great literature, they can write learned articles on abstruse and abstract philosophical subjects, they can ooh and ah over archaeological finds and artwork and other people's religions and so on, uh, but they don't connect it and it's not related to, uh, to, the, to what we want to know if we want to um, establish and engage with the modern society. So there became a quite suspicious uh, debate about all of this and it shows in the society in the early 1960s, when um, a sufficient head of steam had built up to suggest that Scarborough had been aborted and hadn't worked, and there needed to be a new initiative. That's a horrible thing to say, isn't it? There needed to be an initiative, an, an initiative to, uh, to restore confidence in Asian uh, studies. And this was Sir William Hayter's report. And Sir William Hayter, who had, as it were, almost tongue in cheek, seen how Scarborough had been hijacked by classicists of one sort or another, said, what we must have, area studies, combination of language, and other disciplines in the social sciences and in humanity. And people, really felt threatened by this. Of course, that debate played out acrimoniously to us, 
in Cambridge, in Oxford, and in some other places, because the lines were drawn up, because the modernists, you know, the, the journalists, they were getting all the money, they were getting the interdisciplinary centers. And where were we with Sanskrit? Well, we weren't having new post Sanskrit or in papyrology or in really important subjects uh, like that or in. So the society at that point began to change in a way in which it has taken over half a century to work through. And it began to change because the serious people still running the society constantly were bemoaning how you could get the new academic, the young people, the people in the universities to join and to submit articles to the journal, which they were not doing because they were submitting to other journals. They, their social and their intellectual activity was in their own disciplinary areas or cross-disciplinary uh, areas. And the Gerard Clausen, who uh, was another of these enormously interesting, serious-minded public servants, who was really a scholar, the Etonian who had published a critical edition of a Pali text while he was still at school and who learned more languages, more classical languages than there are fingers on two hands. Going from Eton to Oxford, you do great, which of course you have to be extremely clever to do that. But he was also the Bowdoin Sanskrit scholar and he studied Arabic and Syriac and he became a great expert on all the Turkic, Turkic languages. He didn't work in Asia, but he was in the colonial service, and he ended up in the late 1940s as the assistant undersecretary um, in colonial. And he said, and Winstead, who has become one of my heroes, Winstead quoted him in 1963 as saying, 50 years ago, a teacher of any Oriental subject would as soon have thought of walking the streets of London without hat, stick and gloves as of not being authenticated by membership of the society. Now, what does that nice quotation tell you, both about the social nature, the prestige of the society, the prestige of philology, the old subjects they were, and the anxiety about the rough youths who, you know, did not wear gloves to walk up and down blooms. So strenuous efforts were made, but they were on such a sticky wicket, because for one thing, they had not increased the membership fee. It was still three guineas. So they began to run out of money at just the time when the costs began to mount. It was not only the falling away of some public uh, subscription to the society, there was, they were hammered by rate relief, by selective employment tax, by repairs to their buildings. Um, they just didn't know how they could, how they could handle. And we enter this period of, uh, of near bankruptcies of the society. Now, despite what I'm going to say, you should bear in mind that the people who made these hard decisions 
did so because they really had no alternative at the time. And if they hadn't made these hard decisions that I'm going to mention, we would not have been here today. So the society reluctantly uh, comes to a view that uh, it has to do something about its material resourcing. And fair enough, the way to do it was to be ruthless. And they brought in one of their members, who was in bad odor, actually, in 1963, because as director of the School of Oriental and African Studies, he had dared to suggest in a public forum that there was a need for an association of modern Asian studies in London. And Clausen ticked him off publicly uh, for uh, so, uh, so doing. But by, uh, by the late 1980s, Professor Phillips became president. And with his characteristic energy, his capacity for analysis of difficult uh, uh, economic and political situations, he led the society at a time when it was determined to put it on a good footing once and for all by selling a manuscript. The manuscript was sold. It raised more money than any medieval manuscript had raised at the time, 850,000 pounds. And that's about 4 million pounds today. And of course, it was a manuscript that was not complete. So they thought, this is, this is what we can, uh, we can do, and this will give us enough money to secure a decent property, to begin an endowment on which we can live. But this hope was thwarted because, of course, the problems, maintenance and inflation and of costs and of, um, of, 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 of the static membership fee, uh, and of clearly no longer occupying this dominant prestigious position in Oriental studies that the society had enjoyed, uh, this, they all continued. And so you get to the late 1980s and the problem raises its head again. And so they look around and they discover, because they didn't know until this happened, um, there is a suggestion that a manuscript that was in the Natural History Museum should be conserved, should be put on exhibition and conserved. And the manuscript had never been looked at for 50 or more years. And neither the society nor the Natural History Museum had any funds at the time to undertake the necessary repair and conservation of the manuscript. And so it was decided, well, let's sell that. So the society did. And happily, because, you know, even bad deeds get good results sometimes. Happily, the, society, the, the manuscript was bought by a Singaporean businessman, and he has donated it to the National Museum in Singapore, where it is beautifully conserved, where it is easily accessible, uh, and where the society also gets credit from the fact that it still owns the images. These are the Parkar natural history uh, drawing. But from my point of view, my argument, I want to just refer to what the president at the time said 
just to, of course, he didn't want to sell. He didn't want this manuscript to be sold, but there was genuinely no alternative. And he justified it by saying, it's not been looked at for all these years. And of course, there's no scholarly value in art history. Now, of course, since the um, drawings have, have become a public property, as it were, uh, and since that time, you know, one wouldn't dare in any academic gathering now rubbish subjects like art history, material culture, the study of the book, the history of the book, and, and so on. And that just goes back to one of my really early points, that you never can tell, and you actually need to constantly be looking and seeing what you've got, seeing if you can ask new questions. Our wonderful new edition of Todd, for example, that Norbert Peabody has done, is a radical reassessment of Todd, of his history of Rajasthan, and of what the material he brought to the society with it can reveal. And that's because for 150 years or for 100 years, uh, we have had in the academic community a bowdlerized version of Todd. We have a version of Todd that was very cleverly edited to subvert Todd's own views and his own argument. And it was subverted, it was subverted in order to deny an existence of an Indian, of an indigenous Indian um, nationalism. And what Norbert has done has been A, to restore the tech. So volumes one and two of this 800 pound edition, cheap price of Todd, has been to restore it exactly to what you could have bought in 1829 and 1832. And then there is a companion volume, and that, that is without any commentary. Then there is a companion volume that is full of commentary and new scholarship uh, commenting on God and on the text and on what we can find out about it. And it has lifted entirely. We find out far more from the collections that Todd made, the copies of, of manuscripts that he had made. Uh, we can find out far more and far more interesting things uh, than uh, than could ever have been believed from anyone who just read a 20th century edition of the Annals and Antiquities of, of Rajasthan. And the third volume also includes a lot of pictures. And you say, well, you know, it's just a coffee table book. But make no mistake, those pictures have descriptions and analyses that enable us to get a different sort of glimpse of, uh, of medieval Rajasthan and of how Rajasthan was understood in the 1820s and 30s. And that in turn plays into these really hot political debates we're having now about cultural appropriation, about uh, post-colonialism, about decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing collections, and so on. So it's really important, and it's a really important contribution uh, to, uh, to, to scholarship. And similarly, this is such an exciting time, as, as Sarah indicated in her, in her address, this is such an exciting time for Asian studies. I know it's horrid being a university lecturer. Oh, well, I don't know because I'm not, but I mean, it, it, 
more hurried being a university lecturer now than it was when I was one. I accept that totally. But actually, the picture that we have is that the subjects thriving. There are wonderful people doing wonderful work in many academic institutions now. And it, it's coming out, not just, you know, at, at, at the top level of generality um, uh, about globalization and, and silk roads and, and corporative, co corporative structures um, and so on, but it's coming out in really interesting and exciting intellectual ways. We've had the rediscovery of Manning by Ed, based on a collection that came here. We've had Nandini Das, a scholar of early modern travel and literature, British travel, literature, English travel, yeah. writing an amazing book about Sir Thomas Rowe's embassy and tying it in with, uh, with manuscripts from the Mughal court and Mughal, Mughal uh, sources. David Howe, a retired professor of art history who's very knowledgeable about Charles II's collection, has just published a book on the improbable rise of the East India Company, which looks at a lot of these materials and gives a new anton that will help us to understand a lot about imperialism, globalization, finance, corporate structures, the interaction between money and politics and social hierarchies. A couple of weeks ago, Niall Green talked here about his new book about Asia discovers herself. And one of the interesting things there was how translations into English, then being translated back into the language, into the contemporary languages of Asia, established ways of thinking. We might not agree that they were very sad, that, that this is a very satisfactory situation, but it is it is important to understand the complexity of how knowledge is created and then therefore how knowledge is done. And Javid Majid at the talk at the beginning of the year, when we received Michael Lowy's generous donation of William Jones book said quite straightforwardly, I'm going to talk about a very boring subject this evening. I'm going to talk about transliteration. And that was fascinating, actually, because if you are faced with languages where the writing is different, or where the writing doesn't exist, how you put it down, the images you form on the paper, as it were, are, are of enormous influence in determining what you think about the content of that thing. And shortly, uh, Philip J. Stern is coming out with a book on uh, on Empire Incorporated, about the early East India Company. And Joshua um, Perlick, who has published in the Society's Journal, uh, is bringing out what looks like a wonderful book, The East India Company and the Politics of Knowledge, which are going to take us light years away from the ruts into which the debates about Orientalism and so on have been allowed to fall, however stimulating the initial idea behind those debates 
was. And Sarah referred again to the Bailey Prize. The candidates for the Bailey Prize are people who have completed a PhD in the previous year. We're in year five. And we have seen the quality, the interest, the range, the generous range of scholarship that is represented uh, in, in, those, in those submissions. So at 200, we have to be very grateful properly for Sir William Jones, who founded the Asiatic Society in Bengal, out of sheer enthusiasm and exuberance that here were worlds to be discovered, worlds to enjoy, worlds uh, to understand. To the founders, Holbrook, who is a great Sanskritist and a great mathematician and a great public service, servant who was interested in questions of uh, the wages of the poor and how you administer a fair taxation system. And to Todd, who gave collections, and to Hodgson, who spent 30, 40 years in the Himalaya, recording, writing down, uh, researching languages and philosophies. We're rightly grateful for the Oriental Translation Fund publications they came out through the 19th century, some of them very esoteric, some no doubt stimulated popular publications or publications that eventually sort of seeped out into popular British culture and British understanding of Asia. One thinks, for example, of Sir Richard Burton and for the creation a view of, of, of peoples who believe things differently and who behaved differently, although when you got down to it, the sex was much the same and the religion was much the same once you discounted the specific way in which it was all presented. And we're enormously grateful, really, to, um, to the great and the good, the Lord Ray, governor of Bombay, who presided over that great period at the end of the 19th and early 20th century of the society, and who was instrumental in saying, pure scholarship, that's what the society is all about. So we won't let it get its hands dirty. And with his friend Curzon in 2001, he established or he engineered the breakaway of the Central Asian Society because the Royal Asiatic Society doesn't really do politics and economics in Central Asia. And that society, of course, has now become the Royal Society of Asian Affairs. And we're grateful, I think, to the Earl of Scarborough, another governor of Bombay, in, a, in his earlier life um, for the Scarborough report and the work he put in to push that as far forward as, as possible. And we're grateful, I think, to the people who, in a rather sort of bemused way, um, perhaps, uh, thought, um, thought that, uh, that, that, the, that, that the society should perhaps, but should not, not, you know, it didn't really want to, but it should perhaps move uh, into, uh, into a more generous understanding of what the society and its scholarship was all about. Sir Arnold Wilson in the 1930s summed up the 
the anxiety, I think, is the right word of this. When he, and I think, like many, like myself, and many other members of the society, many fellows, in fact, Professor Rob ventured this opinion himself uh, to me in a conversation um, some moons ago. Sir Arnold Wilson, who is Clift Clifton, Sandhurst, the Indian Army, who was absolutely critical in Britain's moment in the Middle East, who ended up um, ruling, uh, leading um, the Bengal Lancers to protect the first oil strikes in Persia, and then who became a civil commissioner in Iraq. As an MP, he called himself a left-wing radical Tory. And he was responsible for the great exhibition of Persian art in Burlington House in 1931. And he said of our journal, and this is where I'm sympathetic with Peter, and I think many fellows of the society. I can think of no learned journal from which I get better value to be brought to realize the great depth of one's own ignorance and of the vast erudition of others is itself an education. So I think really that's what we're all about, that we are, as Sarah has so vividly described to us, on an upswing from that wonderful Robinson Stockwell and their colleagues era, where things were made to come good, where the assertion of scholarship for itself, the assertion of scholarship as something that would do good, the assertion that the society has some sort of role. We don't quite know what that role is in the great scheme of things, in the great landscape of humane studies uh, in this country. But we do know that we have a journal that is different now from what it was in the 1980s. We have a vigorous publications series. We have wonderful lectures and book talks. We have friends, we have networks, we have virtual connections, and we know that we're now in a country where there is more interest in Asia than ever before, where there are more British citizens with an Asian heritage, and where Britain itself is moving to be more properly integrated into a worldwide humane society that recognizes, enjoys, and delights in scholarship. So there we have it. At 200, we are a place for those who are interested in the history, languages, cultures, and regions of Asia, and rightly so. Stop it. Just very quickly, I mean, going towards the end, you 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 shared with us just I suppose a sample of the people that we need to be grateful to, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think all of us here in the room, we're very grateful to you from having put together such a well, I think we've all we'll all leave this room so much better informed and have a much better joined up sense of the society that we belong to and how it's come to be what yes. it is today. So I just want us to thank Gordon again. I think it's been a long evening. I think we won't do kind of like questions. <laughs> we'll just move on, but we'll thank him again before we do so. So thank you very much.